seeking out Taryn for this afternoon's discussion. And we're really fortunate to have her with us. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Taryn Austin is Director of Clinical Operations for the Vermont uh, Invest Employee Assistance Program, uh, or EAAP. She's also been a supervisor and clinical director of the mobile crisis team for the Howard Center in the Brompton area, director of the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence for the Vermont Department of Health. I've been a management consultant to various agencies and community leaders in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Has been a trainer in different seminars and workshops and speaking engagements in Vermont and Africa. No doubt that's because of the similar geography between uh, the Green Mountain State and Africa. Uh, holds a social work and master's degrees in clinical mental health, is licensed in mental health and substance abuse treatment, and has her own private practice, if all the rest wasn't enough, uh, in therapeutic uh, practice dealing with anxiety, depression, and other life and work issues of stress. Taryn, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. So I am now the director of Invest EAP, and I'm not sure. I know that a number of the credit unions are clients of ours. So right. if you are on, on the call, you will know about us. Um, I won't go into great detail right now about what we do, but um, at the end, I can just give you a sense of, of uh, the work I do there. So um, I have a question. I just want to know how many people are actually on this call. Let me just see how many. Okay, so quite a few of you. And I'm wondering if things are comfortable um, actually being on the screen. You don't have to be, but it's just a little easier um, for questions and chatting. And um, one of the things I, I was going to ask is how many people are feeling more, as they were to Joe, how many people are feeling more exhausted now? Okay, my view changed here, sorry. Um, how many people are feeling more exhausted now than when they were commuting to work? At the end of the day, feeling pretty tired. Nods. Okay, I'll put my hand up. <laughs> okay, okay, see some notes there. All right, so what I'm going to do today is just let's normalize what's going on. I think what's, what we're seeing, the common thread, anybody, whether you're a manager, a leader, a CEO, a president, it doesn't matter. We are all emotions don't discriminate. So everybody is experiencing various degrees of uncertainty, fear, sadness, anger, irritability, um, pretty much across the board. So one of the things I was sharing, I, and so I'm so glad you mentioned that about uh, being part of that uh, webinar where you saw two extremes, right? Somebody looking like they're doing just fine through this and somebody else not doing as well, struggling. What's going on is that your body, I mean, I talk about how tired people are at the end of the day, and if your body is constantly under that threat, that's not going away. That's what's happening. So, Taryn, excuse me for interrupting. Could I ask you a favor? Do you mind? Um, I don't. I don't know if you're speaking into a laptop or a microphone, but either way, could you bring it a little closer? Or you get a little I, closer. I think I'm a little closer. You're just a little soft. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Is that a bit better where I am now? That that's a little better. Thank you. Let me see that. Um, that better there where I am now. That that's better. Thanks. I can speak louder too. So just tell me to to up it when you. Thank if you. I'm not loud enough. So um. What's happening is our bodies are constantly being, being attacked, basically. Every time you wear a mask, every time you go to a, a shop, every time you put on the news, and keep going, right? it's, it's ad nauseum. Your body registers that the threat is not gone away. And so what it's doing, it's pumping adrenaline into your body so you can do that fight or flight, right? And we're not going anywhere. So what's happening is at the end of the day, your body has used up your energy resources. So that's what's going on. So even if you are not aware of that, your body is acutely aware at all given times. So that's what's happening with that piece of it. And then when we talk about the fight, flight, and freeze, um, I was saying that you know, when we all froze beautifully. In the beginning, people hunkered down. We stayed at home, listened to the rules. We followed everything. We were afraid, but we, we we were far more diligent and far more understanding and far more accepting of rules. There is no fleeing. No one wants us, but where are we going anyway? There's no fleeing happening. And so your last resource, your last survival mechanism is fight. And you're going to see it either in your own homes, with yourself, with your colleagues, or with your staff. You're going to see irritability. You're going to see dismissive behavior. 
um, defiant behavior, um, sort of um, ignoring people, blaming people. You'll hear blaming the system, or blaming the government, or blaming a colleague, or blaming the manager. It's, it's the only other outlet people feel they have right now. So be acutely aware that that's happening and you will start seeing that playing out. The other thing that I believe very strongly is going on, and am I loud enough right now? Can you hear me? Okay, and um, please jump in at any point. One of the things that's also going on is the loss and grief cycle. And as I said to Joe, I, I am yet to see articles written about this, which is astounding to me because it's clearly what's happening. We have, for those of you who don't know that well, there are usually five stages in the grief cycle. It's not a linear pattern, so you can go from one to the other and backwards and forwards. I'm going to start it in sort of order, but it doesn't really flow that way. First one is denial. You will see it, and I'm going to pick on the young ones. <laughs> you will see it. The young people for this experiment and with this example are yeah, very much, I'm not going to get it because I'm young. Or I'm not going to get, if I do get it, I don't care because it's, I'm going to be, I'll breeze through it because I'm healthy. So that's a denial piece of it. The second piece is that bargaining piece. And you'll see this play out. People saying, ah, I forgot my mask. Oh, well, it's just one, one big gathering and then I'll wear it after this every other time. You start seeing people bargaining to themselves and justifying their behaviors. Then you're going to see that anger, sadness. Those two will often um, sort of move between from one to the other. The sadness, it can be identified in a thousand ways. The sadness of a world that no longer makes sense. The sadness of um, letting your children into this world that doesn't seem to have a bright future. The sadness of independence. The, the sadness of not seeing family members. The sadness, and keep going, right? And, and we all have some sadness around this. And then we have the anger piece the anger piece of a should be caught earlier, or um, this is just ridiculous, it's going on too long, or the figures aren't even that bad, and, and we're losing, the economy is falling apart, we should really be going back to work. And that's that piece where you'll start seeing people blaming other, right? You'll start seeing that, that quick to temper, quick to be a, a more aggressive, um, annoy, annoyed by the simplest thing. I will just share that the other day I was in the supermarket, and, and I saw a gentleman he wasn't standing on his circle. I tell you what, this lady was having none of it. She yelled, she shouted, she performed because he wasn't, he should, she wanted him to be squarely on his six foot circle from where she was. And then he told her that she was going too slowly and that's why he was getting impatient. And then she said, do you want to see slow? And then she picked up her thing and she slowly put it in her cart. And then people started yelling in the line saying, I don't have time for this. It became, it was like a mob, it was like a mob. And it was, it was over nothing, it was over nothing. I think he was five and a half foot away from her. But people were just looking for that outlet. They're looking for something to grab onto. And I think the perfect storm is a lot of time on our hands with, even though we're working full days, we're not traveling, we're not going to movies, we're not probably going to a lot of restaurants, we're not socializing probably the same way we were too much time, and a lot of anxiety. It is a perfect storm, perfect, perfect storm. So um, know that there's my, my sort of um, normalizing what you said. So questions before I move on. Anyone sort of acknowledging, oh yeah, I'm feeling that, or I'm seeing that play out, or I'm struggling with that, or I'm doing great with that. I want to jump in. It does sound familiar. Okay, thank you. Thanks for, for owning that piece. Okay. Okay. So, so Taryn, does, does, or should we expect that that will continue, especially as we head into fall and winter? I mean, yes. is there a relationship or relativity to outside as well? But when you say outside? People being able to be outside. In, yeah. yeah. And I think, I think what you're going to see, and, and I, I just want to preface by saying, I will not be the prophet of doom because there's some amazing things going on in the world too, right? Amazing things happening. But you are going into a dark season. You are going into a season where people might not be able to connect with their family over the Thanksgiving, Christmas, or um, Hanukkah, whatever vacation they were going to be part of. 
And so there is that anticipatory anxiety of th that, first of all, this is going on for a long time and people's energy level, people are burning out. They're feeling tired. They're feeling run down. They're feeling like they want an end now. You know, people notoriously aren't patient by nature and we want to move on. We want to get going. And especially in the, in the world we're living in now, where we're living so much more in that instant gratification space. So to be able to take a pause and slow it down is hard for a lot of people. And sitting in an uncomfortable place is hard for a lot of people. And that's why we distract a lot, right? It's fun, but also it's, I often hear people say, someone's going through depression or they're going through anxiety or they're going through whatever they're going through. And I'm always sort of quick to say, I see very few people going through things. Personally, I see people avoiding I see people sidestepping, I see people self-medicating, I see people jumping over, but actually going through and sitting in that hard space, we've sort of lost that ability to do that. Not all of us, I'm generalizing, but we've lost that ability. And so when you say to people, slow it down, we're not going to give you outlets, we're going to just hold you in this uncomfortable place for longer than feels good, you're going to start seeing spewing out. It's going to spew all over the place. So that's what you're going to see going forward. Not everyone. Some people love skiing and if they can get in the mountain, good for them. Some people um, will probably take up another hobby, which they might not have done prior, which is a great thing. Uh, a lot of us, I think three months ago, didn't even know Zoom existed. Well, five months ago, right? And look at us now. Here we all sit in Zoom and we're all looking pretty darn comfortable you know, in our home spaces. So... Um, I think we're seeing a shift and it doesn't feel comfortable, but it isn't going away anytime soon. Um, but, but the reality is we have the best minds in the world working on it. So I feel comfortable knowing at some point, this is not the first pandemic in life. This is one of many. We just happen to be living through this one. Um, and so it's a, new, it's a new realization of how to navigate it differently. And that's the challenge. How do we navigate this differently? So, one of the things I, I want to share, and I, um, I was saying this the other day, is that this truly is a marathon now. I think we were all hoping for the sprint, that this is not a sprint, that this is the long haul. And the long haul might be another two months, it might be another three months, it might be another six months, we don't know. But I think what's very valuable and to tell your staff and to pace it yourself as leaders is to acknowledge that when you run a marathon, you take breaks. You take water breaks. You know, you, you do the sponge, you know, get yourself cooled down again. You stretch out your car before it gets that cramp because we know that you won't finish the race if you, if you keep sprinting. And for you as leaders, you're holding your staff. You're holding a lot of this pressure, a lot of it. So can I ask, uh, please jump in with questions, but can I ask, um, if, what do you think your greatest challenges are right now? You personally, leading from a distance. And what are your concerns about going forward in the next few months? Challenges, concerns, thoughts? Hey, Taryn, this is Hi. Yvonne. How are Hi. you? Good, thanks. So for me personally, the biggest challenge is just not being able to make that human connection as a leader. Um, I think that people are wired to connect at that human level um, and as beautiful as technology is um, that that is my biggest challenge yeah yes thank you for saying that and I so let's I think the first step is let's put that out there you know I think vulnerable leaders and I'm not saying fall apart leaders I'm saying vulnerable transparent leaders right now it's so interesting you know you, you build up what you think a leader should look like and how you should hold yourself and how you should posture and right now, people are looking for vulnerability. They're looking for you to say, I'm also struggling at times. I, I also wish we had a solution here. You know, I, it's okay to be a little bit more vulnerable right now. And one of the things I was sharing with the company the other day was they have, um, and this is to your point, about is they have staff who don't, for the most part, have internet accessibility. They don't have smartphones. They don't have the money and the wherewithal and the means to connect and so their connection will be showing up at this office every day right to get be it a check or be it a food voucher or be it whatever they were they were getting and 
um, and the staff are saying, you know, we're losing so many people because we don't know how to, we can't bring them in because there's no office now, there's no space for them to connect. And so one of the things I'll share with her, and, I, and I'll say this to you as well, is, you know, I don't remember when last people wrote handwritten notes to someone. There's something lovely about opening a mailbox and getting a note that was addressed to you, that someone took the time to say, hey, thinking about you, miss you, miss the connection, miss, miss that teaming, miss the in-person, whatever you want to say. Something lovely about, it, it doesn't have to be those big, those big things, but it's an acknowledgement that you count. And people are struggling with that right now. So that's the first piece I, I want to mention. The other one is I'm hearing this a lot from employees, that their anxiety is working from home, that they they're almost working longer hours because they want, it's terrified they might lose their jobs. And so they, they say, I've got to look like I'm busy all the time. I've got to constantly be on this computer screen. I've got to look like I only check out at six because if they think that I'm slacking, then I'm in jeopardy. But all that's doing is rising that anxiety, right? That's just raising that anxiety higher, which is what we don't want. So as a leader, it's all about how you show your self-care. You modeling your self-care model of this is how I transition at the end of the day. I pull out my plug from the wall. I switch off my computer and close the lid. Give them tools, give them permission, right, to, to have an end point. Um, and, I, and I share that because I think one of the things we're seeing is people, you know, which we all do at times, we go back into that computer because it's right there. It's, it's at home, it's easy. Uh, it's not good, but it's easy. And so we think, but just one more email, or I'll just quickly check that something didn't come up over the weekend. And our modeling is not good. Because if you're responding on a weekend, your staff, you, you're taking that expectation, why don't you? And so we've got to be a little careful of that piece. You know, in Italy, they actually find you. You're actually fined if you, if you send an email over a weekend. You cannot reach out to stuff over a weekend in in. Actually, not just Italy, in other parts of Europe too. It is actually a no, an absolute no. And you've got to justify that it was really, 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 really a crisis if you reach out to someone. Yeah. So it's an interesting, we're talking about modeling, right? So it's an interesting way of being, and they have one of the best lifestyles ever because they have that boundary line. And I think it is about boundaries, and it's hard to navigate new boundaries when you're not even sure what you're dealing with. So one of the things I'm going to share is that word, the new normal, which you hear a lot. I am going to suggest that you don't use that word. It's only my suggestion. It, if it makes you happy, by all means do it. It is not normal. We are living through a very abnormal time, and we're doing the best we can with what we have. But it's not normal. And from day to day, it changes and shifts. So saying the word new normal often makes people feel like, then what's wrong with me because it doesn't feel normal to me. And so then instead of saying that, they're going to internalize that. And we don't want people internalizing that there's something wrong with me because there's enough going on. We are going to internalize that, no, no, you're doing just fine. We all just navigating through this together. And it's tricky. It's tricky. It's clunky. It's awkward. It's, you know, it's what it is. So be, I would be careful of any words that's of normal or um, that, or saying things, this is the way it's going to be. I don't know that. I don't know that. So let's be careful of, of wording. Questions before I move on, because I can, I can keep chatting. I don't want to overwhelm, overwhelm. Questions, anything else right now that's just jumping up for anyone? So one thing that you asked, you know, what do people think about, and, and one of the things that, that I think about isn't so much about the here and now, but about the future. And, and with regard to, uh, as we, you and I were discussing the other day, yeah. I don't know if it's a lot, but some of the ways that we're doing things right now, like this kind of meeting, right. are going to stick long yeah. after this pandemic is behind us, right? And a lot of it might be for not people reasons, but for economic reasons, you know, uh, an organization that has everybody working remotely, maybe they come to the decision that I don't need to pay so much rent as I was paying or, you know, that type of thing and whatnot. And I, I'm not 
judging whether that's good or bad, it's just going to create a much different dynamic for people relations and the kinds of things that you're thinking about. It's going to be harder for, say, me as an employer to be ascertaining how you as an employee uh, feel or what's good or, or not good with you today and whatnot, because I'm not just you know, having the casual conversation with you as I'm walking down the hallway or something. Now I've got to figure out a different way of okay. connecting being, with being you. A, being a little close. So I, so I want to uh, say that, you know, a lot of people are actually enjoying being at home. So let's not count up those people. A lot of people are really feeling very productive. They're not getting interrupted as much. Um, they're loving the fresh air. They're loving the sunshine. They're liking the space. They're liking their own kitchen. They can go and make a meal when they want to. So there's something positive about that too. So, you know, let's be clear. I think we've got a, for some people, we've got a better way of life, actually. You know, if you're doing long commutes or you might have more time at home, you might be able to have lunch in your garden and enjoy summer. So for a lot of people, it, it's actually working. It's working in their favor. I think a lot of companies are looking at space, as Joe and I were talking, and saying, why am I paying for this big space? But then, Vaughn, as you were saying, People by nature will gravitate back towards people. That's what we do, right? We social animals. So we will gravitate back. So one of the, the um, and, and some companies will have to all be in person because that's the way they function. That's just the, their model. And that's, that's going to be what it's going to be. I do think that if, if and when we get to that, and right now we don't want to cause sort of anticipatory anxiety because everyone will do it differently. But I do think that we need this to settle down before we make big decisions. Because making any decision from emotion, what we know about emotions is they are rational. You do not want to make decisions based on emotion. So, and there's a lot of emotion right now. So I think my caution would be, let this settle down, let this simmer down, and, and then see what it looks like. Because as much as it felt fearful to leave your office space and go home, it might be fearful not to go back into an office space because you felt safe there at one point and now it doesn't feel like a safe space, right? So, so it's really moving with that flow and letting people settle back in and then see where it falls. Uh, but I do think for a lot of companies, there will always need to be checkpoints. So whether it be once a week, everyone has to come into the office because we do a weekly meeting. Or um, I know a company in Bermuda, for example, they do... Um, it's actually, I think, I believe it's an insurance company or an accounting firm. They um, have office space, beautiful office space, but you have to, if, every person has to spend 10 hours in the office a week and you have to book your space within, within the city. You don't have your own office, you book your space. So everyone spends 10 hours and then I think once a month they do a, um, a half day that everyone's got to be in the office. So people will do it differently, but um, and as I said, some people might go back to business as usual and it'll be the same office, same space, same whatever. But this has definitely shaken up um, the way we travel. I think a lot more, more companies will realize, wow, we can actually do a lot of this without doing those huge trips backwards and forwards. Um, so maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think, I think it, it's that, that sort of openness and that curiosity about what can we take from this that, that could work is really the mindset, right? Not, not the other. It's to say, wow, I'm really curious as to how we can save money this way or connect in a different way or, um, yeah, or, or team, or team in a way that, that still feels connected. And I think there are many ways to do that. Other questions right now? What I'm finding, this is Jean from yes. what I'm finding is that our staff aren't taking any time off. They're home, um, there's no place to go, but they're not getting a break because they're not making that effort to take some time to, to um, do something else. For yeah, one. yeah, and, I, and I, right, and I, I'm seeing that too. And I think talking about what we talked about, nowhere to go, or I need mean, places to go, but Jim's like, I've got nowhere to go, which is a mindset because there's lots of amazing places to go. Um, and so it could be a road trip. It could even be, and, and then there's that fear of, if I take time, then I'm going to get behind. Then I'm getting, you know, there's that sort of, there's that, that threat thing, that threat piece. Am I going to be safe? You know, I don't want to stay in another place because I'm not sure how well I've cleaned it. Or I am afraid I'm going to go somewhere and make someone else ill. 
So there's that constant threat that's not going away. That going away doesn't seem like fun anymore. It just feels loaded. It feels loaded. But then they're carrying that around with them. So to your point, they're dragging themselves, the exhausted selves around, <laughs> you know, not actually giving themselves those breaks. So back to the modeling, how you model, right, your breaks. Here are some things you can do as mini breaks. And I know this goes on odd because I'm really talking mini breaks, like four or five minute breaks. One of the things we can do, and I would, and I would do this with staff, is every single one of us at some point wash a dish or eat food. And so let's take eating food. I, and I'm sure some of you have done this before, that mindful eating exercise, but this is a great time to do it. Is the mini break is telling your brain that you've got this for a short period of time. It's all it needs, right? Just to give it a breather from this constant pounding of stress is to say, hey, I got this. And so getting it is when you next look at food or cook a meal, I want you to look at your food like you've never seen it before. You have no idea. And you really look at your food and go, what is that? What is the texture, the color, the, 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 all of it? I mean, the size of it, the diameter of it, the whatever you want. And then I want you to pick it up and smell it. As many senses as you can. Smell your food. Feel the food. Feel exactly what it feels like. Is it spongy? Is it chewy? Then you open your mouth. You're not going to instantly chew and swallow, which is what we do because we're so busy rushing. I want you to actually just put in your tongue, see what happens. Are your salivary glands moving? Can, is it revoking a memory? You know what? Really get into it. Then do one bite. So for example, if you took a chocolate-covered coffee bean, or if you took a, um, a grape, or um, even a lemon, but the smell is going to be different from the skin to when you cut it open, to when you squeeze it, to when you smell it, to when you taste it, right? It's going to be different. It's also going to be different when you first take that lemon to when you actually swallow that lemon, you know, that bean juice, because your body is responding to different cues as it goes. That exercise shouldn't take them more than about four minutes. It's giving your brain four minutes of a breather because you, you focus saying you've taken the focus of threat and you've made it now about, about self-care. Washing a dish, simple thing in the world. Feel the water, feel the temperature. Look at the bubbles if you have soap, right, anything. Feel the texture of the plate, the sponge, the cup, the source of the coffee, like the, the dregs or whatever's coming up. Anything. Focus in. Focus in. It's another, and people say, I have no time. You're doing it anyway. That's why these work, because you're doing it anyway. I'm not asking anyone to do more than what they have. Here's another one. How many of you are sitting right now, shoulders forward? Let's ask a question, because I am. Okay. How many of us are sitting like this, shoulders back? Okay, when you do it, you notice a difference. What you want to do, though, is you don't want, by the way, to raise your shoulders and lift them back. You want to drop your shoulders and lift them back. I'm going to ask that everyone just do that right now. Just take your shoulders, give them down, and then just push them back. Put your chest out. Watch what happens to your breathing. You automatically, you open up your rib cage, which means you give your lungs oxygen. So if you stand, it's actually more effective. But just by doing this, you're opening up your, your whole diaphragm area. Part of why you're so tired is we do everything forward. You know, we type forward, we sit forward, we eat forward, we text forward, we do every, everything is forward. So these muscles in the base of your neck are probably the weakest muscles in your body. And so people talk all the time, neck pain, headaches, lower back issues, right? Because it comes straight from, from this neck area. And if you're constantly sitting this away, your body is, your whole head is being supported by muscles that are incredibly weak. Hence, get headaches. Hence, you get tired because there's no oxygen going in. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is, and I try and do it, I'm not brilliant, but I try and do it every time I stand up my computer, I stand up and I just put my shoulders back, just for like a quick, take a break, like just one big. So right there, you're doing it anyway, you will notice that difference, getting some good oxygen into those lungs. So that's another one. Um, you know, I know the body scan, right? Where am I feeling my tension right now? Shake it on those shoulders. Shake it on that lower back and do the opposite. You always want to do the opposite motion. So if, you know, your neck is forward like this, your, your whole spine is carrying that. Make sure your neck is in. So simple things, just quick checks in the day. Like, what is my, you know, where, where am I? Where's this body at? So that's another one. Um, the other thing that is so valuable is 
you know, I hear people all the time saying, I'm not in control, or it's not, there's no, they, well, they feel out of control. People feel out of control. And when we feel out of control, we feel powerless. And when we feel powerless, we often feel hopeless. And we, right, and that's what's happening. People are feeling out of control, they're feeling overwhelmed, they're feeling powerless about what's going on. And so, and in many different spheres. And so they tend to feel hopeless and helpless. We don't want that because what happens with hopeless and helpless is often that's where anxiety and depression breed. So the goal for your staff and for you is to make them feel more powerful. And we're not talking powerful in, in big ways. We're talking powerful and let them have a voice. We're talking powerful and let them have choices. Now, all choices should lead to a good outcome, right? Would you like to come at 8 or 8.30? You know, would you like to finish at 4 or 4.30? Would you like to say, it's not, you're not really changing the world. You're just offering choices. Choices could be, should we do the Zoom meeting at the end of the day or the beginning of the day? We want your staff to feel like they, they heard, they have a voice, and, that, and they're important. So those ones were talking about that. Yes, go ahead, Juan. Okay, so I I have a question. And yeah. maybe I'm just looking for a magic wand answer. Yes. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the stress of our um, of our colleagues and our employees. <clears throat> and because I'm here in our main branch, mm -hmm. uh, I may I'm truly witnessing that the stress and tension in society is just over the top right now. Um, so not only are our employees dealing with their own stress and tension, but our consumer members are coming in. Uh, I'm beginning to see a lack of civility. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing stress and tension and agitation, and it's being projected onto our staff. Um, so when you take all of the societal stresses and tensions, that exist out there in the world, then add on top of it, um, probably my colleagues here on, on the call are experiencing the same thing. We know that our customer service levels are not where they should be. Um, our call center uh, staff, we're understaffed. We're not answering the phone um, as quickly as we'd like to. Um, it prevents us from being as responsive as we would like to. We're behind on mortgage processing. so. So it's just the perfect storm. So what I'm dealing with on a daily basis now is not just trying to help my individual team members find ways to manage their own personal mm -hmm. stress with this mm -hmm. new environment, but it's ubiquitous. It's happening it's cumulative. everywhere. It's cumulative, yeah. And so I just, I don't, I'm really struggling trying to find how to deliver the coping skills that, that these employees need to deal with their own stress, but then also um, be able to deal with what's being projected onto them. Yeah. And, and you know, we don't know, we don't know what their, their home lives are like, their past lives are like. We've no idea if you've been traumatized before and this might be triggering all sorts of things. We've no idea, right? We've no idea. I think a number of things, I'm gonna go back to how we started, but I wanna say a few things. Number one, number one, the goal, and this is gonna sound so odd because I know the idea is as leaders and managers, we want to, and, and um, yeah, leaders, we want to fix things because that's part of why we got our jobs, right? Because we fix things. We, know, we make those decisions and we work things out. I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound so counterintuitive, but I'm gonna ask you not to fix things. And I'm going to, I think the messaging is we not, we, me, me, me personally, Richard, Joe, Jean, John, uh, is it, what is your name, Dwyer? What is your first name? John. It's John. Okay. Sorry, I thought I'm you. No, 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 John, sorry. I, no, 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 I just, I wanted to, yeah. you, um, so I think what the goal is, and I really mean this, the goal right now is to make it bearable and manageable not fix it, bearable and manageable. People, because that feels doable for people. And so you find your point of saying, I feel bad, I want to sort of almost fix it. You didn't say that word, but you know, you want to sort of fix it. We're not fixing right now. We're making more bearable and more manageable so that people can do the marathon, right? The sprint is fixing. You get to the end, you get your prize. 
We're not doing that anymore. That's gone. So now we're doing the plod. We really are just one step in front of the other to the finish line. And you have to make it more bearable and manageable for that to be a reality. Reality. So that's the first thing, as I think as a manager, is that's the messaging that you have been imparting. Secondly, and I would say this, if you have someone that you can see is struggling, really struggling, as in struggling, they, they've been abused by some person and yelling and shouting at them, then it's okay to say, whew, and I, I really, I want to give you the gift of, of time. I want you to step back, go for a walk around the block. I want you to take a breather, go and get some tea for yourself. Uh, the next, we'll rotate. We'll rotate so that uh, who feels strong right now, who feels like they can handle the next one. And let's rotate this. You know, there's some people that might get triggered by a certain client that comes and is always nasty to them. Someone else might have no problem with that client. Then, then work it out. And that's that teaming piece you want, that, that feeling more in control. You might say people aren't feeling in control. Is giving those options. Hey, I know that, that for you, uh, Mrs. Jones comes in every Tuesday. I know she really gets you going. <laughs> you know, and someone else might say, I have no problem with her. I have a fine relationship. Good. Then we're going to swap. We're going to, we're going to start working out what makes the most sense. So that's part of it. That control piece, which I'm going to get to now, it's so interesting. And this is the balance piece. Your staff, the balance is completely off. I get that completely. You know, they hear the world is bottom of nowhere. It's so it feels. Here's an exercise that I've, I've used a lot, which is going to sound strange, but it's a, it's a good one when you do it is people will often say, um, everything is out of control, I, you know, I, I'm overwhelmed, I can't cope. And then what do you do with that? Then you just sit with that. So the opposite of that is, what are you in control of? And I will tell you, you're in control of what you wore to wear, to, what you wore today. You're in control of where you brushed your teeth. You're in control of showing up for this meeting today. You're in control of how you greeted your loved ones. You're in control of how many people you reached out to. You're in control of, I keep going, by the way, the list is endless. The books you choose to read, you're in control of how much television you want to watch and what shows you watch, and, 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 right? Ad nauseum, and. And so we want to get that balance back. So one of the things that I've, um, it, it's a hospital that I've been doing work with, is I said to them, have a what's not wrong board, right? And people, and they've got a prize, a little thing that they do. And I say, what's not wrong? Because it is so easy to come up with what is wrong. It's the simplest thing in the world. So what's not wrong? It takes a little bit more thought, but I will tell you, people come up with amazing things that are working for them right now. Really amazing things. And so I said to the hospital, why don't you put on a big board? And you know, every week you just draw like the greatest, what's not wrong in someone, and you give them a little, an hour off. Actually, they get an hour off, which time is so valuable, right? Because you're saying they're not taking time, Jean. So yeah. You say, okay, your prize, you know, at the end of this week, you get an hour off, you can leave an hour early or come in an hour late. That's if it's doable or not. Pick something, right? It might be that you get a gift certificate to go to Starbucks or we get your lunch delivered to your home on Wednesday, whatever. You find something that once again makes them feel that you care, makes them feel heard, makes them move in a different direction than doom and gloom. We, because we can live there, it's just not helpful to be there. So. What you don't want to do is minimize what is happening. It's out there, it is happening. But that we have the ability to normalize what we're experiencing. We have the ability to say what's not wrong, what are we in control of, and how do we choose to do that. We have the ability to give our brain many breaks. We have the ability to reach out to people, right? If we, if we are struggling. Now, I'm with an EAP, an employee assistance program, and I will tell you that we have, we offer a lot, but one of the things we offer is a management consultation line. And I will, I'm one of the people on it, but I will tell you, we are the thinking partner for any manager. So that, because managers are often struggling and they don't want to tell their staff they're struggling because they're supposed to be the, the leader, right? They, you know, and, and presence and CEOs, you, you guys are, people are looking up to you and where do you go? And so we're that thinking partner that you can phone and we'll, we'll bash things out together or just be a voice for you, you know, or help you write a difficult letter where you think, ah, I don't want to do this, or how do you have that conversation, or how can I show my vulnerability, or whatever it is you're going through, that's what we do. That's a chunk of what we do in an average day. 
is we help you navigate so you can lead in a way that feels healthier um, and, and more for you to be more in control, right? And how do you lead from a distance, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's, so those are just some of the things we've been talking about is to share that with your staff. And I think honesty goes a long way right now is I don't have the answer, but I will tell you the minute I hear anything. And it doesn't have to be the solution. And by the way, I don't know your staff or yours, so please don't do if this doesn't feel safe or comfortable. But for example, when I used to be the director of a state hospital in the day of the state hospital, I, I people would, would say to me, you know, I would go to, with my staff and, they'd, and I would say, let me tell you what I'm working on. I have no idea where this is heading, but I just want you to know that that this is you know, where, where we act with this, and this is the interesting conversation that came out of it. I, half the things never played out, but they loved the idea that I was keeping them abreast, or that, that I included them in something that would have been normally behind a closed door. Now, obviously, I didn't share confidential stuff, but there's a lot of stuff is to say, you know, we, we don't need a solution, but we're working on these four things. Just wanted to put it out there. Or you can survey your staff. Once again, your survey have got to be things that are positive, right? Do you want to have lunch at 12 or do you want to write to, they have things that they can, because you're looking, you, you're not looking for what isn't working. You're looking for how can we do this differently in a different direction? And that direction should be going up. Or, or normalizing, which means keeping it flat. So surveys are good things. People are not long, three, four questions. Three, four questions. You know, we did one the other day. How would people feel about going back to the office? What would they need to feel safe? It was a survey we put out for a company. What would you need to feel safe? What would you need? Um, who would you need? And what would you need? In other words, who? Um, do you need a mentor? Do you think a support group? Uh, this is a different company, right? Would you need a support group? Um, would you want to be an office of your own? Do, would you like to share with someone? Do you want to divide? Do you, and these are things they, they, could, they could work on. So that's what I'm talking about, that piece. Um, and then the other thing, um, the other thing is, is those, those questions, you know, I think as leaders, and I don't know how you're feeling, but it is ask yourself that question, how am I leading differently? Or am I struggling to lead this way? Because not every leader is good on Zoom. Not every leader is good without a team being there. A lot of people like that in-person interaction that so sort of going to someone's office and, and doing it in the moment on the, off the, on the fly. Some leaders are finding this is a great way because there's a bit of distance. And so it's really finding out what, what is it that I'm needing to be more effective? Or am I actually being amazing and how can I share that with my colleagues? Something that I've learned that works for me. Because that piece is huge. Questions, questions, questions. And Yvonne, I know, I know you wanted to, to fix it, but I will tell you all these little things are going to make it manageable and bearable. And, and that is the goal. And it's so hard to say, someone drop, drop you the standard, you know? And it's not even dropping the standard. It's making it, it's making it, um, it's making it bearable for people. And I think right now people are just looking for that, for that. So you can always go up again, right? <laughs> Questions right now, other questions around that? I'm just aware of the time. Yes. Karen, I, Karen, I just have a, a quick one. Um, most of the folks that are here know me as a pretty emotional person yeah. um, in both good and bad directions sometimes. Yeah. Um, back in February, March, and April, um, my anxiety level was through the roof. And I don't think that's unusual. I think that's pretty normal yep. um, amongst a lot of people and especially anyone who's, you know, of a certain age and might get the virus and yada, yada. Mm -hmm. um, what I've noticed over the last few months though, is that while there's still a certain level of anxiety, I'm not really feeling highs or lows anymore. <laughs> I'm just kind of at a baseline, like three out of 10. <laughs> and it really takes something special to sort of get me excited or get me angry. Um, what do you think and, that's about, John? I mean, I don't want you to share too much, but what do you think, what do you think you've done to, well, no, actually two questions. 
what do you think you've done if you feel comfortable sharing or don't uh, to get yourself to that place and do you think it's a healthy space that you got yourself to or you think eh, i don't like living in this space it's it's definitely a coping mechanism. It's easier to not feel anything than it is to feel all the highs and lows. Yeah. So I think for me, it's just me saying, okay, I, I guess I'm sort of in a constant waiting mode to, to wait this thing out as best I can. Yeah. And you know, it's it's not projected to anyone in my life or or my coworkers or anything else. It's just where I am. And um, not, I don't, I don't like it, <laughs> but I also don't see any way out of it right now until something positive in a major direction happens. So you are slap bang in the fifth stage of grief, which is acceptance. You slap yeah, yeah. bang there. You slap bang there. I don't like this, but tell me what I need to do to get through it. You right there, right? And so a lot of us don't get there because, or we get there for a fleeting moment. To come there. I'm not there anymore. I'm there. Oh, this is annoying. But it's hard. So you are actually right there because that's how you survive. And that is how you're coping. And you, you hit the nail on, on the head. So I'll tell you what's going on. When we, I'm, I'm sure most of you know this, but I'm just do a quick brain thing here, just quick. So prefrontal cortex, rational CEO of our brain, right? This is where the rational thinking happens. Slap bang in the base of our skull, amygdala, survival center. We go... We all know, right? You were saying earlier, you can get emotional, like, whoop, or you're up or down. And it happens instantaneously, right? For most people, we get angry or sad. It's quick, right? We can be fine one moment, then someone can do something, and whoop, there we go. But what's happened is we, our, our rational thinking center closes down, it shuts down, and it goes straight back to that survival center. All those mini breaks I gave you earlier are all ways to slow it down enough to bring yourself back to here. That's what, and you should be functioning from here. Because, right, because a lot of us, that anxiety is a chunk of that was anticipatory anxiety, the fear of the unknown. And you can't fix that because it's the unknown, right? It's, it's out there and it's coming or it might be coming. And so it's exhausting. It takes you nowhere. And so all those mini breaks, all those little tools, be it a body scan, be it meditation, be it listening to a funny movie, be it, um, you know, um, what... It, any distraction, gardening, um, journaling, painting, pick one, is a way of taking your brain and bringing it back to here. Right? Because if you're so, ah, it's very hard to you know, do, do fine art. Do you know what I mean? It's, really, it's, it's hard. So it's really about finding distractions that are healthy distractions to get you through. And for you, you're just like, this one's too hard to do it the other way, so I'm going to do this way, because this way is working for me. And by the way, it would be nice to get to like a four, you know, four or five. But a three is you've made a decision that I'm going to just hunk it down until this thing is done. Um, I don't have to enjoy it necessarily, but I'm going to get through it. And that's that more bearable and manageable piece I'm talking about, right? And hopefully along the way you can, you can watch funny movies or, or a series or you can have a Zoom chat with your friends every Thursday night or some little highlights, because you, you don't want to be going lower than that, right? You want some the odd thing to look forward to. The odd thing to look forward to. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Because it is tough. It is tough. None of us are enjoying it. Well, I speak for myself. It's not fun. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anything that's jumping up? I want to say one last thing, and then I, I do want to hear questions for the last few minutes. You know, the, one of the things about resilient people, I, I used to think way back when that you were born resilient. I really thought that until actually relatively recently. Come to discover that yes, your personality plays a big part and yes, your upbringing. But resiliency is also taught. You can teach yourself resiliency. And two of the things that I am taking from, from now and what you, we are sharing is resilient people do two things. They put things in context right? That's that whole control, not control. It's they put things in context. And number two, they make change before they force to change. And so those are really valuable. And for even with your staff, it's look, look ahead and say, how could we do this differently? If we have to, what would make the most sense? How do people feel about that? And ask those questions, you know, 
what would you need? What would you need if we went in a different direction? What would excite you? you know, what, what, would, what would terrify you? So that you're not going to pounce on people. If people feel like they know, what, we're predictable by nature. We like to know. We like to know. So it's open up that dialogue. Be vulnerable. It's okay to say, hey, I have no idea myself. But I'm, I'm trying to be curious around it. Or I'm, I'm living in a four, right? Like you say, I'm living in a, a one to four. I'm just getting through this, people. This is how I'm doing it. How are you doing it? So really, it's that dialogue piece. It's that connection piece. It's the dialogue piece. Giving them that voice. Giving them some control back. Doing those mini breaks for the brain. Getting that brain right back to the rational thinking. And everything else I've shared, they all work together. It's one big, one big circle of, of good goodness, right? If you can plonk them all together. Questions, last questions. I promise I will shush for the last five minutes and listen. So, so Taryn, just, I don't know if this is a question or observation. So at the beginning, I, I referenced about the possibility, and this doesn't happen in my office, but because it's a small number of people, or I don't think it does anyway, but I imagine the likelihood of this happening probably is in relation to how many employees you have. But uh, what about this, or have you seen any situations where um, there are employees within the same organization that are opposite ends of the spectrum? They both have anxiety, but it's about the opposite ends. You know, those that are, um, you know, very, very concerned and, and have a lot of anxiety about everything that we've talked about. And then ones at the other end whose anxiety perhaps is about the people at the opposite end of the pendulum not understanding why are those people so concerned, you know, and they're, they've gone off the deep end and so on and so forth. And, and I'm just wondering if, if you've, uh, if that's the reality or I'm just imagining that. Um, and uh, what impact or, or, or how that changes the dynamics uh, in your office or, or you know, how you deal with it as an employer. So my, my, I, I could be a long, I could answer it in a long way, but I'll try and make it short. Um, well, number one, you always have that. This, this, this doesn't create new personalities. Right? You've always had people who are more anxious by nature, people who are more depressed by nature, people who are more extroverted, introverted. So that hasn't shifted. You might just see an elevation in what was already there. Right? So positive people are still very positive. And the ones who were more anxious still going to be more anxious. I mean, that's just the nature of who we are as human beings, number one. That's the first piece. Number two is, you know, this is a wonderful time in life to be kind to each other. Because what people are posturing and showing you might not be what's going on inside. Might not be at all. I don't know what's going on. So they might be presenting. It might be denial, right? It might be um, that they desperately want you to think that they're strong, and that they're doing this well. I don't know if they're weeping the whole way home. You don't have any sense of that. And so we quick to judge right now because of what we were saying earlier. And so I would caution people to, um, I think it's okay to ask. I think it's okay to say to somebody, Wow, I'm really like struggling over here. It seems like you're just bouncing right through this. Like, tell me what you're doing that I'm not doing. I think you can have conversation and dialogue. I think it's okay to say, listen, I think you're a great coworker, but I tell you, this is kind of annoying when you, you know, you're bouncing here like this because I, I feel like what's wrong with me? That I think it's how you have the conversation. I think if it means that person really upsets you, like really upsets you, and uh, to the point you're like, if they come here one more time, I'm going to scream. Right, because whatever, it, whatever extreme, then that's when you're going to have to go to your HR, you're going to go to your boss, you're going to go to your supervisor. If you're an EAP, you come to our EAP, that's what EAP does. We'll help you navigate those difficult conversations you want to have or normalize your experience to that person. Like what's really going on? Like what are they poking in you that's getting you so riled up? So if you're an EAP, I encourage you, that's a great use of an EAP. Um, and then if it's a person, you can maybe not be in the same offices then for you no know, without making them upset. Or if you honest, I think it's okay to have a conversation. Like tell me what you are doing that you always bring in here, you're also excited. Or if you're really miserable, it's I have no idea what you're going through and you're experiencing, but it seems like a lot and I, and I get it because we, you know there's a lot going on in the world. But I want to tell you I'm trying really hard to maintain maintain like a, a, a more positive attitude. And I feel sometimes like I feel like I can be pulled down a little bit. Like, is it okay if I share that with you? You know, when I feel that's happening. It all depends on your relationship with someone. 
but it's how you have that conversation. And yes, you're going to always see that. You're always going to see the people who up until a week ago, or two weeks ago, who weren't going to wear a mask in the supermarket, right? So that'll just get you from one to zero. I'm wearing this for your safety and you're doing that for me. It's not just this, it's human. It's, we've lived like this always. We're just now focusing in on this. And focusing in, when I said too much time, too much anxiety, too much emotion going on, we don't want to start homing in on one person. We want to step back and say, what's going on for me? What's happening inside here? What's the person? What's happening? And can I say it in a way that feels respectful? Do I need to say it? Do I need to get extra support outside of it? What do I need to navigate through this? Because blowing up at someone, not going to help. Which we know. So, so there are avenues, there are options. Does that help a little bit, Joe? I mean, it's not... Yeah, yeah thank you. Other questions, comments for Taryn from anybody? So Taryn, here's your chance to do the shameless plug. If somebody wants to get a hold of you <laughs> to talk further or find out what, find out more about EAP, although we have some credit unions <clears throat> that have been working with your organization, most on the call probably have not. So um, how can yeah. we get a hold of you or find out more? I wasn't going to do a plug, just so you know. Thank you, Joe. I was not going to do that. Um, I will do a little quick plug. Only because I, I really think it's um, it's so valuable right now. It's always valuable. But our EAP is Invest EAP. We're based in Burlington. Uh, we have over 260 companies who use us. Um, we have 73 therapists who are all licensed therapists who work in the state of Vermont. And now we, we branch out into New Hampshire, New York, and, and other areas as well, actually, as people starting to do more remote work. Um, and there is honestly no problem too big or too small that we can't support you and guide you with. So um, it's, it's been around for a long time. Uh, I think we do a really good job. Uh, we do some financial support, we do some legal support. We, we do a lot of things, a lot of things. We'll help with daycare, we help with um, resources is probably the big one. You know, another huge one is that resource piece of connecting you to resources to help navigate through, through things. Um, it supports anyone in your family or anyone who lives under your roof. So be it a roommate, be it a girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, au pair, old, old, old relative, doesn't matter, they, they covered, they covered under our EAP. And so, yeah, I, I'm more than happy to share my telephone number. Um, uh, as I said, I, I, was, I felt awkward plugging it because it wasn't really my, my intention today. But uh, so my number, if anyone's interested, is 999 8910. So very easy. 999 So, And so, yeah, I'm the clinical director. Um, and we, we do and we do a lot of webinars for companies and we'll, we'll do, you know, we do trainings and all sorts of good things. Well, thank so, you, Taryn. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Thanks very much. So anybody feel comfortable reaching out to Taryn after this call for yeah. whatever your curiosities or needs may be? Um, and again, thank you so much, Taryn, for jumping on this call with us. Thanks, really. And I'm happy if, you know, as I said, if you want to find a just chat, chat later, you know, I, I'm going to be at my desk for probably the next 20 minutes. Um, so I'm here. But thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank I hope you, you can take one or two of those skills and use them. Okay. Bye. Um, Taryn. Bye. Just a couple quick notes for the rest of you. Um, you know that on Saturday, the House passed a $25 billion uh, USPS funding plan. Um, you know, who knows what happens next uh, with anything in Washington, but I would not think that that would be likely to go very far this week in DC, particularly because of the Republican uh, convention starting with well, that already started this morning. So I, I don't think we expect much else to be going on in Congress uh, this week as far as passage of things. Um, the third thing that, that I'll mention to you is I've written in the update that I sent out daily, I think it was last Thursday or Friday about uh, the GSE. Uh, add-on fee that's being added of another half percent that's going to be charged to lenders for anybody that refinances a Fannie or Freddie uh, loan. Um, and as we were on the call here, I got forwarded a draft letter to be signed by all credit union leagues um, to uh, express our objection to that fee. And similar letters are going to be coming out of the, the ABA and the Mortgage Bankers Association and so on and so forth. And I just want to apprise you of that. Um, other than that, uh, anybody have anything else? 
If not, um, like I did for Taryn, I want to thank you all for joining on the call today. Thanks very much. I think it was an informative discussion. I hope you do too. Hope you have a great evening and a great week. Thank you, Joe.